replaced the the main position of a chair and a clerk the last meeting Great. they're they're good okay yeah. Great. thank you um the other thing we'll add is just on the discussion items um we looked at the mailer cover last meeting and said we'd look at it again this weekend with the revision. So we'll add that as 9.3 Okay, um, consent agenda to approve the minutes of Thursday, February 15th, uh, regular, and the minutes of Thursday, February 15th, uh, special um, informational meeting. You willing to entertain a motion to approve both? Of course. Second. A motion to approve both. Okay. Second. Any, any discussion? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, the minutes are approved. Um, is there anybody who would like to make any public comment at this time? Okay, then we'll move to board comment. <coughs> Go ahead. I want to thank outgoing member Chris Jarvis for all his hard work. Um, I really had no idea how hard that guy works until I sat on a board with him, <laughs> being on both this and the select board. So uh, I've one will miss him and having to pick up everything that that guy did he was great thank you I'll second that <laughs> yeah um, we did receive uh, an email um, from uh, Kathleen Hasse um, about the after the um, musical I forwarded that to everybody today so um, you can look at that and read that um, supporting um, the board's efforts with the um, the um, music program and supporting that. So um, we'll put that in the minutes as well. I don't know if this would be a time to comment, um, whether this is a comment or a question. So stop me if it's not relevant right now. I was just curious um, if we're going to be doing anything for um, April 8th, like are the kids going to be able to get out of school early that day to... That'd be a good question for me under the superintendent report. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other board comment? Okay, then we'll continue with the board reorganization. Um, first elect a vice chairperson. Nominate Rodney Rainville. Is there a second? Second. All, All right. Um, any discussion? Okay. All in favor of Rodney for vice chairman, chairperson? Aye. 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 Okay. Rodney, you're yep. vice chairperson. Thank you. All right. Appoint three per members to the WRVSU full board. Um, and just so everybody knows, we get three voting members on the full board. Generally, we encourage everybody to go to all the SU meetings, since most of the time, you know, everybody gets <coughs> to participate in the discussion, even if, even if you're not voting, and you know, that way we make sure that we have our three voting members there. It's also important to know what's going on at the board, so. Um, but we should choose our three primary um, full board Members. I concurrently nominate the chair and the vice chair for the first two positions. Okay. Anybody interested in being the third? Um, yeah. Okay. okay. I'll include my nomination. Vice chair, chair, vice chair, and Nancy. Nancy. Okay. okay. Um, I'll second that. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think we need to vote on these, right? We can just. No, it's, unless it's unless you can't agree, there can be a motion. But you, it, it can be done by appointment consensus. All right. Yep. We will. So, uh, what about the alternates? Can we name the other three to be? Yep. The alternates at this time. You could at that same time. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, Andrew, Rodney, and Nancy are the three voting members, and Ed. Um, Peggy and Julie are the three alternates. All right, um, appoint one member to the WRVSU Executive Board. 
Um, I nominate uh, Andrew, the chair, to be on the executive board. Seconded. Check. Any other discussion on that? Okay. Then uh, one alternate to the WRVSU executive board. I nominate Rodney Rainville. Great. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, one member for signing AP and payroll. Um, I've, I've been doing that for the last few years. Yeah. I'll nominate Rodney for that. That's fine. Okay. Um, we, yeah, and we can appoint more than one alternate. We need at least one alternate um, for signing AP and payroll. I served as the alternate last year, and I don't mind doing that. Okay. I, mean, I, I didn't have to cover for a months, but no, I didn't. It, but it's no, all done happy to. Anyway, so. Right. But it does have to be, if it's not, it has to be done at some times. Yep. I'm happy to serve as an alternate. Okay. I nominated as a. Yeah. Last year we did Ed, Peggy, and Nancy as alternates. Or no, that was for the full board. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Okay, yep. Yeah, okay. So Ed will be the alternate for signing AP and payroll. Okay, one member to the Negotiation Council. This was... I did that last did year. That last year. You okay with doing that again? I can do that again, sure. Is anybody else interested in doing the Negotiation Council? Um, what... Negotiations are up this year? Nothing right now. We'll start probably in August preparing for teacher negotiations. Um, that contract um, is through next year, but we'll start in the fall. The only question, I will do it. Do either of you ladies want a chance to do it? If you do, that's also fine. I think I have a conflict of interest. I don't think I okay. could do it. Where? I could do it if you wanted off of it. Or if, I could do something else, either way. Oh, uh, what, what's left? Would that be a conflict of interest? <laughs> since well, she's a teacher. She's, a teacher. she's not a bargaining member here. Yeah, okay. Um, okay I'd so. have a really hard time doing it being a former teacher myself. I don't mind doing it. Okay. I just don't want to stand in the way if yeah. former teachers are interested in <laughs> the process. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I would just say, Ed, you were only on it for the, that short time, but Little. I, mean, I do appreciate it when we're able to try to keep that somewhat consistent across the SU because it builds <laughs> momentum within the team. Oh, then um, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I, I thought you did a nice job, Ed. So. Okay. Okay. So. I got it. Unless there's any further discussion, we'll have Ed be the mm -hmm. member on the negotiation council. Um, appoint one member to the policy committee. Ms. Rodney's been the member for the last few years. Mm -hmm. Policy committee. Yeah, yeah, I don't mind doing that. I'll nominate Rodney. Um, the policy committee meetings are half an hour before the full board uh, meetings, SU board meetings. So half an hour to an hour. Yeah. yeah. And everybody's welcome to go to those as well, even if you're not the official member. <coughs> okay. So we'll have Rodney on the policy committee. Is there an alternate that wants to be part of policy? We'll always take people to policy. <coughs> if you guys want to send another person right we're good with that if anyone's interested i'll probably come to the policy i figured you might a little bit but. okay um appoint one member to the superintendent evaluation committee um i, I, I could be on that unless huh, just one member I, I don't were you last year yeah this year yeah i think i, I nominate andrew I don't know that we even had this as an official thing last year, but okay. Um, appointing a truant officer. Well, we had the student board member. Sorry. Oh right. Yeah. Sorry. No, that was after. You 16. said after. You wanted it before. Six point eleven. I said. We'll, we'll do oh, it. Now. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I, mean, I, I had it's ten point five too. Sorry. You're right. You're right. All right. Appointing a truant officer. Uh, this was. The Royalton Police Chief, Bethel Constables, and Principals as truant officers last year. I'd suggest uh, the Royalton again and Windsor County Sheriffs. Okay. Um, and they'll work in conjunction with our principals. Um, just Windsor County is now contracted with the town of Bethel. Um, they're doing some liaison work with us in general. So I think having both Royalton and Windsor County makes sense. 
-hmm. So Win Windsor Police Chief. Windsor County Sheriff. Yep. Uh, Windsor County Sheriff and the Royalton Police Chief. Yep. Okay, so I'll, I'll propose the Windsor County Sheriff and the Royalton Police Chief be the true and officer. Okay. Do we have a second on that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, now we can appoint a student board member. All right, so I'd like to introduce our junior represent, representing the Wildcats. Uh, Hannah Collins is a um, athlete and a band member and a community member at our school. She represents really what Wildcat Nation is all about. Um, she's a positive influence, and um, and she she we've been trying to get Hannah to come to the board meeting, but basketball has kind of gotten away the last few months. Um, so she's here with us, and uh, she is a perfect person, I think, to have represent the student body at our school. Great. Absolutely, motion to appoint a student member to the council. Happily. Second. All right. Well, welcome to the. Yeah, thank you, board. Board. yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I'll, I'm going to meet with Hannah and I'll meet with Principal Thomas to figure out, like, I'd like to have it be that there's like a standing report from the students mm -hmm. in general that Hannah delivers um, so that there's some interaction back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll work through that and then try to schedule the agenda too. Mm -hmm. So that if there are things that are, don't feel as relevant, we can try to schedule it accordingly. Great. Does that make sense to the board? And we'll just keep rechecking how it's working. Yeah. Great. And feel free to, you know, chime in if you have things you'd like to contribute. Thank so. you. Very happy you're here. All right. Um, designating newspaper and radio station for official notices. Um, I think we do the Valley News and the Randolph Herald. And um, Great Eastern Radio, I think. And Great Eastern Radio. Which captures a bunch of different stations. We had the Greater Vermont broadcasters as yep, well. Probably that's true too. Yep. Okay. So I guess I'd. Motion to have a continuance of everyone we used last year to use this year. Okay. So that's the Randolph Herald, Valley News, Greater Vermont broadcasters. Um, oh, so that's Randolph Herald, Herald and Valley News is a designated newspapers. Greater Vermont Broadcasters is a designated television station, and Greater Eastern Radio as designated radio station for official notices. Thank you. I needed that clarification. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Unless there is any further discussion on that, we'll um, move to the date, time, and location of regular regular school board meetings. So it's currently the third Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m., alternating monthly between Bethel and Royalton campuses, and also virtually. Mm -hmm. Want to stick with that? I think it's been uh, working. Yeah, out. I'll make it on the uh, motion to uh, have the meetings on the third Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. Uh, Alternating campuses. Okay, we have a second? Second. Okay. All right, um, and designating posting places. <clears throat> so the posting places um, are, last year we designated the post offices, town offices, and school entrances, and the website as designated posting places. Post offices, town offices, uh, school entrances, school entrances, and the website, and the website. Okay, I'll put that forward and nominate those places as the designated posting places. Second. Okay. Any further discussion on that item? Do you want to post it on the town website too? Um, I mean we. Could try doing that. Um, we can try. I'd hate to have it be the designated, and I can't do it. Yeah, I, mm. I think not having you know, like we need to go through somebody to get it up on, on their website. So, yeah, you know, I think it's a good idea to do it, but maybe we can, do that as an alternate place, not the designated place. You know. Yeah. 
Uh, but that is a good idea. What about front page forum? Can that be a designated place? I think it should be an alternate place. Alternate. Okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, having an official kind of school, like we need somebody in Bethel and we're <coughs> they're not. Completely. Yeah, and we're paying now, but we're still limited to two only a month. And yeah, okay. I would rather. We can certainly use all that for alternate. It's just I can control those other ones. I can't control some of those. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, that is the end of the reorganization um, <coughs> business. So we'll move to the celebration of learning. And that's on me tonight, folks. Good evening. Right, if you don't mind bringing up that brief PowerPoint. So my intention tonight is to uh, put on display for you the evolution of how things are going in the makerspace, specifically how it parallels the work being done in our flexible pathways, and leave you with the, here are the one or mix the questions, the vision we have for where we're going in the future, um, specifically including the full-time position um, we are now going to be advertising for, for someone that will be running the shop and the makerspace. So right now, Mr. Andrew West is running Flexible Pathways, uh, offered as a, an essential class for many students, but also supplemented with a lot of one-on-one -on -one and small group work throughout the day. Um, what you see <coughs> right there is one of the first prototypes of the signage that we have around uh, this space, and I'll pass out an example later. Cut on, unfortunately, imported plywood because it's formaldehyde free, but um, on a number of different materials. Uh, we started prototyping, figuring out the exact depth, intensity of the laser, duration, font, all the things that would make a, a clear product. If you don't mind advancing, please. <coughs> this is just a, a quick montage snapshot of where that space is now. Um, what you see there is it is packed full of different kinds of technology, not just the laser engraver I'm very proud of uh, and happy to talk about, but also things all the way down to a hand loom. Um, we have new sewing machines in there. In the picture on the left, you see a station that is designed for uh, vinyl cutting. What we have produced out of that, though I don't have examples to show you tonight, we have produced uh, prototype t-shirts and sweatshirts. Uh, we envision not just fundraising potential, but ways to increase the branding of the Wildcat name uh, for a much more cost-effective measure and to get some students' appetites wet for graphic design. We have a heat press, vinyl cutter, all kinds of product uh, to experiment with. I'd like to thank Ray and his crew for providing, making sure we have um, up-to-date touch-sensitive panel. Our teachers are already using that. It's a way to have the students focus on the task of the day to display how a schematic might lay out and then turn them loose on their own projects. Uh, and on the far right is just really something I want you to bear in mind as what that space is intended for. That center area, the tables pushed together, that's really where students start their project, where they come up with the sketches, the ideas, where they brainstorm, where they come back together and do assembly. It really is designed to be the tools are the tools, but the intention is to have the makers working together. If you don't mind, please advance it. The next several slides are just showing you, again, the evolution of the kinds of products that are being made there. That was an original <coughs> prototype from one of our 3D printers. I recognize it's a 2D picture. You can't see the raised um, bar relief of that LIB. That was done by a teacher. It was done very simply. Find the schematic online, input that into the, um, the program, and let the printer go uh, have at it. Please advance to the next one. If you notice, there's a higher level of sophistication. There's a much more um, defined font. There's a relief of a different kind of figure. That was made by a student. One of the things every student in the middle school will have done by the time they leave here in June is they will have created something in that maker space. For many, it may be as simple as <coughs> designing a keychain, a small fob, a small thing just to get um, dip their toes into the pool, so to speak. But again, the evolution between the first product and this one, um, much finer detail. We don't have to build the product up, product up as much, uh, so we can have much more intricate pieces. 
please continue. And it's not just in the 3D printing. Uh, in the upper left, uh, on the left-hand side, you see some of the simpler signs we have made. Prototype, again, a keychain fob on the left. And what we've advanced to now is getting to the point of uh, one student on the right, those are student hands, uh, said, hey, I want to do more than just make a key fob. I want to do something more complex. So they found a pattern for a puzzle. They ended up figuring out with the instructor in there how to put the picture on, cut it out, and it's a fully working, functional wooden puzzle. Uh, so the evolution from an adult-directed, adult-set-up product with a student observing to the student creating the idea and actually then creating the product. Please advance. It's not just the intricacies of using a laser engraver or cutter or a vinyl cutter. Those are very precise tools. But it's also, we want to showcase in that space the intention is to be very creative as well. Uh, there's a lot of call for us paying attention to the fabric arts. Again, I mentioned the loom and the sewing machine. In this particular case, a student brought in their own sneakers and put on a pretty anatomically correct uh, set of foot bones. Uh, just working within a design that they had in their head. None of that was made using one of the schematic computer-driven kinds of products. That was done with a 3D printing pen, of which we have a half dozen or so. So that's freehand experimenting with fabric, dyes, and paints. Please. I'll leave you with this one. Uh, again, the tools in there are very capable of precise work, but at the same time, working right next to that person who's inputting a schematic, using a laser engraver, is someone that's doing a lot of freehand work as well. So in the same space, you have some people that are very focused on the technical aspect, some people that are very focused on the creative aspect, and a blend of everything in between. I believe that's the last picture. If a picture is worth a thousand words and something you can hold in your hand, maybe it's an entire novel. These are some specifically chosen examples. That is a sign that is going to complement a student suspension bridge that they built at the beginning of the year. This is an example, you could also see some more down the hallway of how can we turn what we're learning into something that benefits the school. Signage is a very clear way to start. You just simply need to choose the font, choose the parameters. But in terms of experimentation, we're getting pretty intricate. We're also getting down to the point where I can't read that without my progressive lenses on it. Hit that fully, I need my cheaters to read that. That's down in the seven point font. And you can see there aren't trailing burn lines, it's clear font. We're getting better and better. A side note, something we have yet to wrap our heads around is all of the words on there are generated from a chatbot. A parameter was given, tell us a story about, and it created the poem. So that's a complete untrodden path. From, in terms of our 3D printer, these all look the same, but they're an experiment in really what is possible. I encourage you to move them around. When first using the 3D printers, um, we had to dial it in. We had to figure out what we were actually doing because we were, if something goes haywire in the 3D printing, it goes haywire wildly and creates a giant spaghetti monster. <laughs> These are examples of, we are now down to incredibly fine detail. And if you look at how many different angles and curves are involved in these pieces, again, that's just to highlight what's possible, as is that. One of the benefits of using this particular birch plywood is um, we can figure out how to make curves, how to make soft shapes. That's an example of a box project that was done as a prototype. But any number of things are possible, including that's one side of a multifaceted figure. That's just the first one we've etched out. So in terms of where I wanted to leave you, how is this informing our vision for moving forward in the future? We've radically expanded the conversation around how we use flexible pathways with a couple of benefits. One of the benefits is looking at how to free up room for students like eighth graders to take an elective kind of offering, get their hands into the maker space, um, and using the flexible pathways as a way to really dial in a personalized education. 
The experiment we ran this year, we have three students working on their own one-on-one -on -one projects with the Flexible Pathways Coordinator as the facilitator of their learning, working hand-in-hand -hand with the person that is helping us uh, really tune that space. We envision that's what Flexible Pathways is really going to look like for our students, especially as we consider things like capstone projects, a lot of personalized learning. I know that I've presented the two things almost as if they're married together. It's just one example of how the flexible pathways will be used in this space. We envision um, a lot of co-teaching. Teacher in a core class has a project they want to complete. They work with someone in the maker space to figure out how many different ways can we prototype, make the thought a real tangible product. Any questions on what I presented to you tonight? Um, I think it's great that we have these tools and, and we're starting to figure out how to use them and leverage them in student learning. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak to how, how students are accessing it kind of in the schedule? Like what kind of time are sure. we talking about that's put aside for this sort of thing? So in terms of the parameters of our schedule right now, Flexible Pathways is offered in the morning. That's when our essential classes happen. So in terms of a group of students, a dozen, um, going in and using the space, they're doing projects in tandem with our shop teacher, with our outdoor ed teacher, and with Andy West at a Flexible Pathways. So they're access, many are accessing it through their already assigned class time. Several more are getting it as, um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Student has intervention services and also extension services. During the extension time where they're uh, deepening their learning, they have access to that space in much smaller numbers. So we might have, again, one to three in a few different periods during the day. We have as much as a dozen in there. Um, that space has been used by Outdoor Ed repeatedly for things like creating first aid kits to donate to the town, um, plotting out the next projects to start unifying <coughs> how the campsites are laid out, thinking about um, different ways they can accessorize the like TP structure, the campsites, et cetera. So they're accessing it any number of ways. Looking at next year, I think we'll have a higher proportion of students, especially in the older grades, who will be access accessing it during portions of a class. So I, I receive the content in science class, I do the task for that assignment, and then I spend the second half of class potentially working in the maker space, um, building the next piece I'll need for the next day's experiment. Uh, I think that's about the level of specificity we're at right now, or is really wondering what are the possibilities? How can students access that space through the program, but also looking at not just this shiny new toy that we have of the maker space, but how does it work in conjunction with um, some more traditional necessary skills. How does that function with um, the sap we're boiling out back, with the shop, with the outdoor ed, <coughs> with the science classroom? Thank you for your question. Does anybody have any other questions or comments about the makerspace? I think there was a question online on the chat room. I did hear something. Uh, it looked like it was for the public comment time. Okay. So um, I think that's oh, I thought actually a I do I do wonder if you give us a generation of artisans, mm -hmm. are we then going to be needing more equipment for the older kids as they transition? You and, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing to get these kids all ramped up, but if if you breed a, a bigger clique of artisans making stuff. Mm -hmm. sneakers and and uh, 3d printing and everything are we gonna need a little bit more stuff for the older kids as those kids become the older kids and instead of the I don't know say five kids doing it now you've got 15 kids that want to continue mm -hmm. uh, etching wood or and I know they can come back over here but that poses a difficulty a little bit sure there are some logistics in figuring out how um, some of Jeff's students might access that space. Mm. I think that's one of the minor challenges of how we plan out those logistics. Uh, I see that as being one of the easiest ways for his students to access that space. 
Forgive me if this seems tangential. One of my favorite shows is Texas Metal. I love watching people build cars. That's one of my side passions. And I was watching an episode just yesterday, and the vast majority of the tools that their interior person was using are just larger versions of what we have here. So I don't have an answer directly, I have a question. How do we further boost access to tech ed programs so that when our graduates are getting out with those job skills that give them honest pay, good jobs that fit their passions? That might sound buzz line-ish, but I think that is something to consider. First step, his students, how do they access that space? Second step, how do we bolster um, on inroads into tech education? And then ultimately, Speaking off the cuff, how do we secure another grant that provides this amazing opportunity to really turn the school into a showcase of the community space? So I'm sorry that's not an exact answer, but that's where my thoughts are. I was just wondering, we, we need to be prepared when this works exceptionally. I think be prepared for six. You probably should be prepared to, I mean, you, you're already constantly answering the question of how do we best serve our students. Yeah. And I think what you're asking is a prescient question for down the road. Because um, we're talking a job skill from, you know, pressing hydraulic fittings for your timber jack to working next door to prototyping and advanced animations or whatever it might look like. There are a lot of industries around us that could use a wide bevy of skills. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure if you know how to use CAD in eighth grade, you're probably going someplace decent. <laughs> so, I, don't, I don't disagree. Right. It's yeah. amazing to me how... Um, Dating myself, I'm a Commodore 64 generation. I had CAD in middle school that was nothing like what we have available here in terms of visually, but conceptually, it's not that different. The skills they're learning to make something simple like that are the same skills they're going to use on a CNC machine um, that they're going to use to, I don't know, um, customize someone's 4x. Well, one thing I would say about, you know, now that we have staff dedicated to the middle school for tech ed, that frees up the high school tech ed teacher to, to have more time to focus on that. Oh, yeah. High school, we have so. the FTE. Yeah. And a tech ed teacher at the high school that is an old school draftsman, but also one of the most adaptable people I've met. He's had a, a big hand in the conversations of this, uh, creating the makerspace. Again, thinking down the road, what is that student I haven't met yet going to need to know how to do? Well, thank you very much for you. keeping us up to date on that. It's exciting uh, development. Um, we'll go to Jamie. How's everyone doing? Good. <clears throat> so you have my, you have my uh, report in hand. Uh, I did provide some progress monitoring on my um, superintendent professional goals um, for this year um, and where we're at. One of the things I want to uh, I'll highlight is that the full board will be receiving um, a draft of the communications plan for the SU. Um, that's a three-year articulated plan, but also provides a lot of um, forward-facing information for our public. Um, but also internally in regards to just how to navigate communication um, within the system um, that I think will provide some good visuals. That will go to the full board in their packet on Thursday. We'll look for feedback from administration and, and the board throughout the upcoming month um, and then po possibly take action in April. So it, it's, a, it's a pretty comprehensive document. It's probably what, Ray, 30 pages? Uh, not quite, but it. Yeah, I think it hits on what folks are looking for. Uh, so you'll have that. Um, we're also going to have a draft of the uh, WRVSU portrait of a uh, learner. Um, we met with the graphic designer for that um, last week. That's been an SUY group that's had student representation, teachers, um, some community and board members from across the supervisory union working on that. That should be... Uh, something that gives a really good graphic for us in regards to what we want our students to know, understand, and do in regards to transferable skills um, across all different exit points of the organization, meaning whether you're leaving, um, you know, the middle school in eighth grade, like what is it that we want our kids to have in regards to 
skills that we apply throughout our entire life, right? Like that's the idea. Like we have our curriculum that really speaks to our content area standards, right? Um, and then this is supposed to give a, hopefully a really good graphic in a two pager that can really say to folks like, here are the, what we really value in those, um, in regards to those transferable skills across content areas and in, in secondary and post-secondary pursuits. So. Um, as soon as that's done, that will get sent out to the full board for comment. Um, and then, you know, another thing uh, to update the board about is um, in regards to the legislation, I don't expect there to be any, cha any more changes to education funding um, in this session. I do think there's possibly going to be a task force that's going to study education funding um, moving forward and possibly look for them to take action on how we fund education as a state next year. I don't see them putting a bill together this year. What I would say to you, though, is that um, I do expect that the yield's going to hold, if not increase, which is good in regards to tax rates decreasing even further than what we um, originally estimated. Um, some districts are already using a 10,000 yield, which is will be a few more cents. Um, and they're using that 10,000 yield based on what the Joint Fiscal Office is currently talking about and in discussions with House Ways and Means due to adjustments that are coming in in regards to districts revising budgets after um, failed budgets occurring. And so just a reminder that, you know, it is a statewide ed fund. If spending across the state goes down, then that yield number would go up because they don't need to generate as much revenue in. So. Um, I think that that's, that's good news for us. We're currently, we, I mean, I still have four more budgets to, to go to voters uh, across the SU, so we're still currently using the number that we used in our presentation because I don't have any uh, formal um, guidance from the agency or the Joint Fiscal Office to use that 10,000 number. But in, for some reason, if you were hearing districts using that number, uh, some are. Um, we always try to estimate conservatively with that number. I would hate to put out a number, and then have it go not be that high. I would rather it goes to the good. So that could be good news for our, our constituents. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And then finally, um, and then I'll try to answer your question too, Nancy. I think I know what it is, but then we can have some more dialogue on it. Um, I wanted the board to know that one of the education bills that I do think is going to actually uh, possibly pass this year is a literacy bill that's tied to the science of reading. It aligns to the work that we're doing here already in regards to our, our foundational uh, reading work. Um, there was a bill that, that, this has been discussed now for the last two sessions about the notion of um, ensuring within statute that schools are aligning their curriculum to the science of reading, making certain we're teaching phonemic awareness and phonics, and that we have a researcher-based approach to that, which we do. We made that shift um, last year in regards to ensuring that you know we're doing professional development and that we have a research-based approach to teach phonics. Um, and so I do, that went through the Senate, and it's in the House now, and I think it may cross over. I think that that bill is actually going to pass. Um, and we'll see what the governor does. I haven't heard any um, indication that he wouldn't support that bill, but um, that's so far, you know, specific to education, one of those bills that did seem to, to get across. Because um, we're at crossover now, so. What exactly, would, like, are they... It essentially says you have to align your curriculum. Is there any kind of and your mechanism or just like, what's that? Do you have to like submit a report? My sense is it's going to probably be part of the egg quality standards. I haven't looked at the bull, um, bull, bill fully to see how they're going to ensure that we implement, but my sense is it'll be part of the superintendent assurances. Okay. Um, and then April 8th, I, I believe April 8th um, is the eclipse. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we're having a normal day. I'm going to put out a letter to let families know that they can pick their uh, student up early if they choose, and we would waive. Um, that is just an excused absence. One of the reasons we're doing a full day is that we do have some trips planned across the SU where some students are going to go actually observe. Um, 
even in the hectic of the buses and stuff, we've supported them going and doing that. And then our One Planet program, we have events planned that afternoon as well for our students. Um, and it just felt like from an equity standpoint, making certain that kids can have access where their parents might not have been there with them to even supervise and help provide access, that it made more sense to allow for both. If parents want to pick their kids up, they can. But for kids who parents don't have the means to do that or supervise them or support them in those efforts, that we would provide that too. And do we have do we have a good supply of glasses? Yeah. Do in elementary? Yeah, no, we have, yeah. And One Planet has ordered a bunch of them too, and so I'm feeling pretty good about it. Yeah. Yeah, so I just, and I'm going to explain that to families. Like, if they want to pick their children up, absolutely please do. But I was really concerned about the notion, too, that some kids might not get the opportunity or supervision around it if we just sent them home. So I wanted to provide both. Yeah. That sounds good. Thanks. Oh, I had another question for yeah. you. The community task force, did we get any response at town meetings? For people volunteering? Yeah, so I have a list to at least get us going, and we can then appoint more uh, more membership as well. But yeah, when we come to that agenda item, there is a oh, okay. we're yeah no. If we add a couple board members, we're at ten. So it's a, it, it's got representation from both towns. So yes. I think it's enough that we should move forward with it, and if people start to show more interest, we can appoint more membership too. All right, principals. We have our reports <coughs> I think highlight uh, for the elementary. Um, you can read it all, but I think I will launch into our upper level science teachers have really uh, been doing a lot of work with upcoming um, solar eclipse. And so we will be busing the Bethel campus in the morning over to the South Royalton campus for some science-based eclipse activities. Uh, all the kids are getting solar eclipse t-shirts. So, um, we're really excited to have printed to remember the solar eclipse. And then um, each science teacher, upper level science teacher on each campus, is, there's a letter going home inviting families and kids if they want to stay. We're going to host, host our watch parties at each campus. Because it's still going to be, even if we're not in the in the perfect viewing spot, it's going to be pretty amazing here anyways. So. Um, yeah, so um, that's the big, the big highlight that we've been working on. Um, other highlights that you can read through is just what um, we've been doing for some professional development around here. Highlights what we've been doing with our Wildcat groups um, and what we've been learning about with the Positivity Project. If you look at um, this online, you can click on and see our Students of the Month, which is always fun to check out. Uh, we've been moving into the, the talk about wrapping, you know, continuing this year, but also planning for next year, talking about configurations for the next school year, uh, working on the BT cap testing right now, which we're going to report on the last, the last year's testing after this, but um, teachers have been working on that in classrooms, getting that done. Uh, and what else? Uh, planning for conferences, I think, is the final thing for that. Very similar struggle life in the middle school. Uh, we are looking forward to student-led conferences that begin in earnest next Monday, although some have already be, have started to take place. Um, we're very excited about that. We discussed today as a faculty um, the intention behind the student-led, uh, what are we trying to produce, and if a student does not have someone show up for their presentation, how are we giving them the opportunity to have their work honored? Again, that starts next week for uh, the middle school VT cap. There, I need to make a correction. I stated in the principal's report we're starting on April 1st. Apparently, that is an April Fool's joke. Uh, we're starting actually on the 3rd. Uh, the only other thing I'd really like to highlight, um, there are a couple of pieces in the principal's report alluding to uh, the beginnings of a conversation we're having in the middle school regarding um, safety. We hope to have things that inform potential capital improvement projects, specifically the front entrances, but also other things around this side of the school. The reason I mention it's just beginning is because we know our partners in the other schools have had similar conversations, and the next step is inviting them to the table to figure out um, where our system needs to continue improving, <coughs> we're in the list of updating uh, crisis plans, making sure principals' names appear in correct spots, uh, in the last week, we have had walkthroughs with fire marshals, 
EMS, the Sheriff's Department, the Fire Chief, Windsor County Sheriff's Department, and uh, we still work with Royalton. Getting an idea of what are the small improvements that we can make on the daily that don't cost the taxpayers a lot of money, and what do we need to be able to present to you so you can make an intelligent decision for the things that excuse me, might cost a little bit of money, like the entrances. So we've begun that, we've plunged into that work earnestly. Highlighting the high school, uh, congratulations to Clover Radicone, who is our first graduate, 2024. So she took a lot of flexible pathways to get there. Uh, speaking of flexible pathways in work-based learning, uh, one of our uh, drones crashed the other day when we were doing a test run. And so we're going to be using the 3D printer in the makerspace to replace some of the parts that were <laughs> damaged. So thank you. Yeah. Um, we started the CAP, the Vermont CAP testing on Monday and today for the ninth grade, and we will finish science tomorrow. A um, couple other things. If you had the opportunity this weekend to see the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, our uh, performance was phenomenal. We invited our middle school on uh, Thursday, and so they were able to come and see that performance. It's also used as a recruiting tool to get the kids to see what we're all about at the high school. Um, speaking of recruiting, we have on April 11th the We Are Wildcat Night, where we uh, give tours, have food, give out swag, invite all the um, kids from 7th and 8th grade to come and parents to visit. Our staff will be in the gym um, showing, showcasing what we offer at our high school. Um, both basketball teams made it to the Barry Auditorium this year, which was an exciting, uh, exciting two trips up there. Um, so hopefully we'll be doing that again next year. Our Art and Soul is coming on Wednesday, March 27th, uh, which is a huge event for our school and our community. Uh, Josh White is organizing the alumni basketball game, a little different this year. Todd was the MVP last year, who was in, in attendance here, won the three-point shooting contest. Um, so all that money that's raised goes to our food shelf, which is really nice. It's donations only. So that's the report. All right, thanks. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments on the report side of things? Um, so we're doing the BT cap data report now. Yeah. <clears throat> so it was really prepared for us by Honda, so we really should give her credit. Uh, I think I'd be lying if I said that the elementary has dug into this data at this moment. We have not yet. Um, and I think that we will be digging into it, but more looking at cohorts and seeing if the cohort data is matching what we're seeing with our more current track by progress um, and planning accordingly for that. And I'm assuming, I, I know I think uh, middle school and high school might be in different spots and have actually looked at this, but I think we're all saying the same thing as far as uh, looking to see if it checks in with our track and progress data and seeing if there's specific cohorts that we need to tune in for. Um, <coughs> I was pleasantly surprised by how, we, how long we did in science, given that we have had a huge focus on science personally. But I don't know if you two want to weigh in a little bit more on that. that. I would echo much of what my colleague has said. We have looked at specific cohorts and because we're looking at BT cap data, uh, it is older, it's over a year old. Uh, we're looking at how local assessments, um, track my progress, work in the classrooms might support, indicate, suggest something very similar. Uh, and looking at what well, are the interventions we're currently using, do we need more? Those are the kinds of conversations we're having around a particular cohort that um, was scaled very differently than state average. So we're using it to inform a next step. I think there's a lot more we can glean from looking at this, again, comparing it to what we have uh, already locally and also much fresher data than this particular set. I am anxious to see when we have two VTCAP data sets together uh, and we're comparing the apple to the apple. And we're hoping, because I think what we've been told is we'll get that this summer. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe that can better influence our planning. And I guess at the high school level, one thing I struggle with is the incentive for our students to do well. Um, you know, some kids are like, well, I don't get credit, and I'm not getting graded, and so we, we talk a lot to the freshmen about, like, how important it is. It's important to our school and the community and to do as well as you can, because these results are, you know, everyone knows about this, and this is important. And, uh, you know, it's easy to say, like, the fast bridge assessments that we do in math, like, it's important because that's going to be, to do well in there, because that's what level of math you're going to be going into. Um, but for this, we're, we're, we've struggled a little bit, and kids have come up and said that they're having a hard time with, uh, with that incentive. So, um, and we work, you know, we sort of teach, not to the test, but we teach kids how to, you know, trial and error. Like that first one, A doesn't look like it's right, that answer doesn't make sense. And actually on the test, you can cross out A. So you know you can look at B, C, and D for the answer. And it's just, you know, given, having kids sort of do the best that they can, and that's really all we're looking for. And what's interesting is on the test, you can see how much time they spent. So on the ELA part of it, you know, there's three paragraphs, and the kids spent two seconds on it. You know they didn't really give it a good effort, but the results are still, you know, shown on the graph. So that's something we're working on as a staff. So you guys were saying you haven't really gotten a chance to compare this to the track my progress results? In the elementary, we have not had time to look at it. I believe the middle school's already dug into it a little bit. We've started down that path, yes. I think, again, there's more we can glean from looking at that data. Um, right now, we're focused on, again, looking at a cohort. Okay, what might account for that? How does that compare to what we have for other data sources? Um, more what can be done. Yeah, I mean, it certainly seems like getting it almost a year later really it's hard. Yeah. doesn't give it much utility but you know it, it does seem like we do need to improve on this and the track my progress results have certainly been encouraging as far mm -hmm. as the trend and, and so, i believe what i also heard from Honda is they're still tuning up bt cap to make sure it's like aligned with the sbac that we used to take so anyways i'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how we do a year out from that Right. Another, yeah, it's more information I'm getting from our math teachers who took the tests are saying that a lot of the math for the ninth grade are, is geometry and some algebra two, and some of them are in algebra one or pre algebra, so it doesn't really match up. So I think kids, you know, one of my students today told me, Mr. Thomas, the first question was some geometry. I'm not in geometry, I'm in like pre algebra. So, and I was like, well, did you give up? He goes, no, I just couldn't answer it. And I was like, all right, you know. But I do understand the frustration. Is this one of those computer adaptive tests that winds up finding the level, or is it just no? No, no, it's not. I thought okay. it was because you could breeze through it fairly quickly. I don't think so. Can I ask a question? Or not? Not no. yet. No, go ahead. Is that okay? <laughs> so the results we're looking at, these are from almost a year ago. Yeah. And they're taking them again right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's and we just yeah. had this feedback. Yeah. That's yeah. concerning. Yeah. It yeah. Is. They switched from the previous, like they switched yes. test sure, providers. Yeah. So, you know. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not saying this as, sorry. I Go ahead. By the chair. I'm not saying this as a professed expert. I have a lot left to learn as well. I was in a different school and noticed because I was looking at a much bigger scale, the number of like growing pains kinds of issues that we had at the beginning of the VT cap last year. A lot of those have been worked out, and I'm hoping that's indicative of what Andres has said, Andres, sorry, Andres has said, that we should see the results a lot faster. And if we have that quick turnaround, well, we can compare yeah. in a, in a much more active, time. Right. right. Yeah. And again, if we get it this summer, the kind of work that we have our professionals doing over the summer to intentionally plan their lessons, how they're aligned, um, they can also be looking at in both elementary, middle, the foundational skills that we'll need to pre-teach before we get to different concepts be a lot more informative if we have it this summer. Sure. Thank you. Where does this test come from? Mm -hmm. Is it generated in Vermont, or is this part of a consortium of other states? I think it's Vermont. Mm -hmm. No, I think there's a bunch of other. Okay. Let me find out. I think I should know this, but. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm just curious because again, if it's they're testing ninth graders and they're putting Algebra two and geometry questions on there, very few right. ninth know. graders are doing geometry even. Right. Yeah. Um, having been part of the state committee back years ago that was developing tests. I used to get pretty discouraged at what people who were not in education thought was the right questions to be putting on a test for, um, yeah. I remember sixth graders, they were putting questions on the coordinate plane and um, simultaneous, uh, graphing simultaneous equations and they told me, oh no, sixth graders should be able to do this. <laughs> and I'm like, no, you haven't been in a school. <laughs> Let me reach out to Amanda. She'll know better. <clears throat> but I think they do a lot of tests for a lot of other states. If I'm... I also found that when I was working on these committees, that the majority of the people that were also on these committees that had been hired were out of work engineers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why the calculus is on there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I just get very skeptical about any of the standardized testing that's developed like in that way that teacher and teachers are not even allowed to see it. That's the part that bothers me that you know, we're not even supposed to see what this test is that the kids are doing. Um, right. But. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess I don't think anybody wants us to be teaching to the test or anything like that. So you know, no, and, but they do say that you can teach kids how to take a test, though, right. you know, and, and improve that. Yeah, no, that so that's some sense. of the teaching that we do in advance. Right. Yeah. So I guess, like, when you were talking about changing the curriculum, that was more just looking at what kind of the proficiencies and stuff that they're supposed to have and then making sure that our curriculum's aligned with what the test is, is looking at? Or, uh, well... So the fast bridge assessment, some of our students are taking that because they are failing at semester. They are failing algebra one, so a lot of them have stopped because it progresses and they can't progress because they haven't been able sure. to do that. So we took that fast bridge assessment in math, and then we were able to find out what level they're at, and then have transitional math to support them so that they're ready for algebra one next year. Yeah. But there'll be sophomores in taking algebra one. And really, they should be in Algebra One as a freshman. So. Right. Yeah. No, it makes sense to use the track my progress and fast bridge is kind of like our baselines. Baselines yeah. and yeah. stuff. But. Yeah. Okay. Um, does anybody have any other questions or comments on the ET cap data? Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, we'll see some positive momentum on that going forward. Um, all right, Tara, business manager's report. You all have my report. In addition to what's happening in the business office, we are still working to get four budgets votes through, so I've been working on informational mailers and the necessities for that. But otherwise, if there's any questions. Thank you, Tara. Um, thank you for all your help getting the budget put together and all the information for the budget presentations and things. So, All right, um, policy committee update. Uh, not really a lot to report. We've been working on the drug and alcohol policy. <coughs> and that was sent away to legal for some questions on it. You didn't get that back. I'm gonna yeah you will have the policy committee will have a new draft of that and then our Sorry. our workplace harassment policy um, and a coordinated title nine policy All right so basically we'll wait for that to come back from legal and that's about it okay nothing really mm -hmm. alright then uh, we're on to the EEI summer 2025 building project mm -hmm. we may um, do you mind going to 9.2? No. I've got Eric working on something right now. That's why I came and got it. <laughs> okay. Oh, are you ready, I'm buddy? Ready. All I'm right. ready to go. I was yeah. buying you some time if you needed it. No, you're good. good? I'm good. All right. 
good to have EI around, you know what I mean? If you need something <laughs> checked on. Uh, yeah, we'll get that solved. I did do an energy audit when you guys, earlier in the meeting, I was going around like noticing fans in the gym were still running, and we'll, we'll address that moving forward. So. <laughs> Uh, all right, we'll jump to the next slide because you guys already know who we are. Next slide again. Um, obviously, we're energy efficient investments. We just got done doing lighting here at Royalton and at Bethel. We'll do the heating system upgrades here at Bethel as well. Um, next slide. So what we've been doing and what we've been, we met with a facilities task force about two months ago, um, reviewed some of the initial ECM measures or energy cost measures that we talked about a year prior when we were looking at doing this Bethel upgrade. Um, at the time, um, we had brought in high-level building assessments, so we have um, architectural review, electrical, mechanical reviews on both buildings. Um, and then really, um, we reviewed a lot of those different um, aspects at our meeting, and we've really kind of settled on a few main goals to focus on for development really being the Performing Arts Center um, at Royalton with a new secured entrance, um, library ventilation at the high school as well, um, secured entrances here at Bethel, so addressing both the middle school and the elementary school entrances, um, updates to the original gym um, at Royalton to make it more of a performing arts center and ready for performances, and then finally site drainage, which is a combination of um, the three acre rule that the state of Vermont has put out for storm water retention, and then also with the new addition that would be going on, you'd automatically be forced into making those adjustments now. So next slide. Um, the first measure, the ECM measure, is the Performing Arts Center, which would be an addition off the front of the building. Um, I know that there's been some conversations with Danwell Architects, who's leading the design for us, I'm trying to get to a little better point so I can view it. Um, they had some initial concepts that they provided about two months ago. Um, at that time, Jeff and Josh met with Matt on site. They reviewed the, the, the project and kind of the layout. They've come up with a couple different options for kind of the redesign on it, really focusing on trying to make this new high school entrance as vegetable kind of a combination of both, you know, where the new high school students actually having a formal entrance closer to their parking lot while also serving as a main lobby for what could be potentially performances in the original gym or in the new Performing Arts Center. So kind of having that combination of addressing both secured entrances while creating that kind of central vestibule area when um, they're in intermission where people can kind of collect and, and regroup. So um, this is something that will continue to be developed um, with additional renderings, um, exterior renderings and floor plan redesign based on more meetings with Josh and Jeff as we fully understand their needs. Um, so I think you know these redesigns just came out yesterday, so I would say in probably another two to three weeks when we can get it all coordinated, we'll meet back as a group, review it, I'm sure make more changes, and then hopefully over the next couple months kind of settle on what that final layout is and what we're gonna be providing pricing for over the summertime. All right, next slide. So this is showing some of the render, uh, exterior renderings and layout, showing a new entrance that would be on that driveway side as you head down to the ball fields. Um, originally, they had shown a pretty formal grand entrance at the main street. Um, after talks with Jeff and Josh, that's kind of that's going to be going away, and really, you know, the attention is going to be back towards that parking lot side and the main entrance to the high school. Um, and then this kind of whole redesign with the big glass spaniels is, is really getting reworked as well. We just didn't have time to update the renderings for this meeting, but we should be able to for June. Next slide. Library ventilation. Um, this is something that we would be looking at addressing, so adding ventilation to both the library and then there's also a science room right next to it. Um, so going with a central energy recovery unit that would have dehumidification with heat pump technology. Um, to really update the ventilation in this space, which currently really has no ventilation for the amount of people in it. Um, this would provide um, a central spot at the high school that has cooling or at least dehumidification in it. Um, so on those warm you know, September days, at least there's some refuge for people to be able to go off to and cool down during the day. Um, next slide. Secured entrances, so specifically at Bethel, because um, really the, the entrance at the high school, like I said, would be addressed as part of the Performing Arts Center. Um, the idea being that at Royalton, um, if we add a new entrance onto that driveway side of the high school, we can add a connector that would essentially bring you around the old gym to the new Performing Arts Center that would prevent you from having to go through the old gym to access the new Performing Arts Center. So. 
um, access per, um, and then here at Bethel, we'd be looking at trying to reuse kind of some of the existing infrastructure <laughs> that you guys have. So updating the doors on the inside of the building, reusing kind of this overlook and vestibule that you have now, per repurposing this administration door to really be that check-in window for people as they come into the space. So going back to, you know, really having that lockdown vestibule area where um, they get buzzed in through, through an initial set of doors, those doors would close behind them, you provide a line of access site to the people that come to the door, and then they buzz you through essentially the second set of doors. Um, and then something, doing something very similar at the elementary school, but actually you guys already have doors in this kind of catch-all vestibule area already in that space. So it's really kind of just changing some of the door hardware around in that kind of main vestibule, adding some cameras, some um, push action uh, locks to be able to let people in and out of that area. Um, and really we can accomplish a lot of the same things without having to do any new additions, but really just upgrading door hardwares and the door themselves. And then also a little programming change. So as the elementary school's kids go to the cafeteria, Instead of walking through by that front door to enter through those double doors of the calf, they would be walking by essentially the trophy case and entering the cafeteria that way. So um, this was something that we reviewed a couple times already, um, really just trying to keep the cost down or at least you know, trying to provide a product that meets the goals of the group, the security goals, um, well, keeping the cost in line because these secured entrances can get really pricey quickly. Um, next slide. Original gym, as I mentioned, um, this is a gym that they use for performing arts. Um, there's a stage, so what we'd be looking at doing here is providing really kind of a design for this space that would repurpose it really specific for performances. So making sure that we have a sound system, a lighting system, um, and building controls that essentially would lend itself for performances, music uh, plays, and those types of things. And um, a lot of that stuff, um, as we talked about, is kind of going to be a la carte. So we're going to try to break out that pricing. I know at one time um, there was thoughts that maybe fundraising specific for different items inside of the original gym might be a good option. So finding someone that might want to pay specifically for stage lighting or a sound system. So those are all items that um, we're going to kind of break out and kind of stand alone for you guys to see what the cost of those would be. Um, next slide. And then finally, the site drainage. Um, and then this is really about adding a retention pond and a catch basin down below your guys' existing parking lot. Um, and then essentially, we'd have to incorporate any new roof drain, storm drains from the new addition, um, and really just move all the water to this. And this is a state mandate. This is something that the, the school was already working on with um, DeWolf Engineering as a civil engineer. Um, they just happen to be a civil engineer we do a lot of work with as well. Um, so we would just have to make sure that we would incorporate this because all of a sudden you just you move up in that list of having being required to do it under this project. So next slide. So really what we're looking at right now is kind of a, a rough magnitude of cost of project budget around five and a half million. Um, that's addressing the Performing Arts Center, the library HVAC, the secured entrance, the original gym, and the stormwater improvements. Um, so next slide. And what I'm doing here today is kind of providing you guys that original outline and overview with some updated drawings from that original Performing Arts Center. Um, what we would do over these next few months, um, as long as we continue to get consensus from the board that this is the direction that you guys want to move with, um, we'll continue to meet with Josh and Jeff to kind of finalize that design. We would do the same with Pierre here at the Bethel Middle School with the secured entrances, reviewing it with the admin team and some of the security professionals that we work with. Finalize those drawings and those concepts, make sure that they work with your guys' programming, and then come back to you guys in probably May or June with really kind of that schematic drawing that we feel that we can go out and get, get good pricing on. Um, we would then spend the summertime, month and a half by midsummer, kind of coming up with um, a true, a much better, more real price. So we go out to subcontractors, get actual pricing. We're moving away from the magnitude of cost and getting actual subcontractor present at that point. So really that by the end of the summer, we can come back to you guys and say, these are schematic level, you know, 80% drawings. These are pricing that coincide with where those drawings come in at. So that hopefully by the end of the summer and beginning of September, you guys would be looking at doing a warrant article that would put this on a November 5th bond vote 
um, to move forward. And if this gets passed in November, we can sign a contract in December with the idea of breaking ground on the Performing Arts Center spring of 2025 and, and really try to have everything in this place wrapped up by you know, the, the spring of 2026. Um, some of the projects at Bethel or maybe some of the smaller ones might get, we might need that summer of 2026 as well. Um, next slide. I think that's it. That is it. So that's roughly what we've been working on at this point with, the, with um, a schedule and a rough budget that we're working towards right now. Um, don't know if anybody, if anybody has any questions in regards to that. Um, I thought at one point it was both the library and the cafeteria that were lacking ventilation. They yeah. are, yep. And you guys want to keep the cafeteria in that as well? I mean, I would Task lose. Force took it out, just oh, so you guys okay. know, based on price point because we leave those doors open a lot to the cafeteria. Okay. So there was just some, remember Rodney, we had this conversation. Do you remember this one? We took it out. It was a couple, last. it was like maybe two meetings ago. And we did an air quality test in there actually through Efficiency Vermont and that space actually did pretty well, surprisingly. So they do, they I just really, think because we have the doors open. So and what much, happens in cafeterias is they run game. such a negative through their exhaust fan that they're just sucking in all of that <laughs> air kind of from kind of the surrounding areas, even though it doesn't really meet current code of how you would design a cafeteria in a kitchen today. Um, when we efficiency Vermont for air monitoring devices in some of the spaces, and the cafeteria was actually one of the best performing uh, oh. <laughs> air quality spaces, which was kind of surprising to me based mm -hmm. on what we originally saw. <clears throat> so it also is a low use space, so you know people are in there for 45 minutes or an hour essentially, and then, you know, that space kind of goes away, where CO2 builds up when you're in a space like this over a period of time, typically. What was the pricing on that, just out of, like... It would be, like, probably around 250 to 300,000 yeah. to provide dedicated ventilation to that space. Okay. Uh, Peggy? She's muted. Yeah, you're muted. You're muted. There we go. I always forget that. <laughs> Um, my question was on the visibility for the stage when everything is done. Is the stage being still basically going to be level the way it is? Or, because I, I always think about people who are at the very back of the auditorium wanting to see what's happening on the stage and you really can't see. Is something being done to improve it is. visibility? That was part of the, the work that Matt and Josh and, uh, and Jeff had talked about. So. I don't have drawings yet of the original uh, gymnasium for today, but I know the stage was a major aspect of that. We're looking at tiered seating for the audience and also for music performance, uh, have tiered seating and staging for the musicians on stage as well. So by, would that be kind of temporary things that you bring out and put on the... Correct. Okay. Nice. And there's some includes storage space for the, all that sort of stuff. Yes. Right? Yeah. That's been a big, yeah, storage space, maintaining egresses out of those spaces, fire ratings, those are all kind of what uh, I know Matt and Josh have been kind of bouncing their heads around because it's, there's some funky door situations that we have to do. It's not ideal. It's fire code it's requirements. Years, yeah. So we'd have to, it's one of those things that we have to plan because this is what code says and then we go back to essentially the local fire marshal and be like, this is kind of ridiculous. Like, why do you have two doors four feet away from each other when the exit door is another 10 feet away? Like, it doesn't, you can't really wrap your hand around why it makes fire safety sense. So we're hoping that we can kind of, kind of convince the fire marshal for that as well. So what we would do over this next kind of few months is really kind of really dive into the programming and make sure that it really meets the needs of what you guys are trying to accomplish um, and then we would spend, hopefully, review back with the facilities group, get your guys okay that this is really the direction that we want to go with. And then I have to get it out to subs to get, I think, more real pricing for you guys because this is a pretty massive project. There's a lot of different components comp uh, <coughs> comprised of it. So um, I just want to make sure that if you guys go out for that November bond vote that we're able to provide everything that we're saying that's going to be in it. So we, everything goes well. We start spring of 2025. What is the disruption of the status quo going to look like all the way till spring of 2026? Because at some point, the building is going to be worked on pretty 
heavily, but we're going to have kids coming and going. It's going to be very, it's going to be some rework of some of the drives. It's going to be kind of rework of how people move around the school. It's a, definitely a tight footprint, as you mm -hmm. see, as people come in there. So it might even involve clearing some of those trees between like the parking lot and the drive and reconnecting the parking lot lower down so that we can kind of section off an area up at the top. But we'd have to review all that because those are fire egress lanes with the with the fire marshal. So a lot of times what we're doing is like soft barriers down through there mm -hmm. um, that you know emergency vehicles can still get through. But <coughs> is all that into taking into account already for price? Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, I feel good about that part. All right. A uh, little off topic, but I, I don't think I went to the last facility meeting, but uh, how's the heating system coming in Bethel? It's it's done. We are just working on a, f a few last little punch list items. I know he said he was here again yesterday <coughs> fixing an igniter on the wood boiler. Um, LP, everything's up and running. Um, I noticed today that there's definitely some setbacks that we can, um, energy optimization that we're going to be implementing over the next week or so um, in the place, but... Overall, um, we have a couple of last punch list items I noticed in the bathroom that will be getting addressed um, probably this week because I wasn't very happy when I saw those. So, uh, yeah, we're very close. Did you end up burning any wood this winter? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've oh, been yeah, burning yeah, wood yeah. for the last, yeah. since uh, end of this year, since December 31st. It's been oh, okay. primarily wood chip. So. Okay, good. That's what I had Eric just looking at. Was the wood chip boiler? <laughs> no, okay. oh, I, I didn't know. I, I hadn't heard if it was how, how it worked out. But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I haven't had any complaints. So. Uh, well, that's good, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I know. The, I know the school's been warm this winter, and not, but not too hot. <laughs> that's good. We've been trying to dial it in. There. <laughs> yeah. We do anything right. Let's keep the temperature. <laughs> yeah, so it is a little. I when I was doing like a review, I noticed like. We can be setting temperatures back. There's a handful of fans kind of still running at night. So there's going to be more kind of energy adjustments that we can make over the next month to still dial these things in. And really for us, you know, like I mentioned kind of all along, we are trying to build these long-term relationships with the school district. We're not going anywhere. Um, we're getting more and more people specifically living in this area, which has been a big help that live within a few minutes, it's always uh, been tough. It's a very attractive location for getting subcontractors because you're kind of in between Manchester and Burlington. So it is, but for some reason, just we need more people that live in this geographic area. So, so that is coming along very well, so. Um, I'd be curious to see kind of a timeline of what um, kind of is available for use when, as far as, you know, like, is the elementary gym going to be out of commission like from all next until spring of next year or you know like i can come up with a much for the next meeting because i think i was maybe coming on in june or something like that i'm going to come back in june but i can have a pretty detailed site layout that shows really where you know what we have to kind of section off for construction fencing and what i would see is kind of a phasing for this project um, you know, one of the things that we try to do is if there's enabling projects, like I said, like that maybe builds a road around a certain area or creating that initial kind of path around um, the gymnasium, we would look at, you know, cutting in additional doors to help with kind of the flow of people through spaces. So right. I haven't got quite to that part yet of really thinking about how we phase this thing out, but that would be something that we need to figure out in order to get accurate pricing through the summertime. Right. Okay, uh, be good to see. Um, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. thank you. Thank you, guys. Good luck for the rest of the meeting. Okay. Can I also just say I, I think your solar eclipse move was a phenomenal move by going both ways. <laughs> yeah. I will yeah, be no, I providing childcare for my we have science testing tomorrow for juniors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> got to do a curfew. You got a curfew. <laughs> okay, um, community engagement task force possible action.
So, um, Mary Shell, our community school coordinator, is going to really take the lead in helping facilitate this group. Um, moving forward, we will warn these as um, open meetings. I just think it's really important for us to do that to keep people abreast on the work that's happening, even though we won't have a quorum of the board necessarily. I'd like to to do it that way just to, you know, allow the public to engage as much as possible. Um, and so we have, um, and, you know, in regards to, you know, their charge, I think that their charge is to, you know, truly get a sense of the community, like how the White River Unified District is going, um, based on the articles of agreement, but also based on the fact that we are, um, is it five or six years now into the merger? I think it's five. Five? Right. right. I'm in year well, four. So it's one year. before me, so five years into the merger. So, um, you know, I think that their work may be even two-phased, right? Like, I think there's the initial articles of agreement piece, and I think there's also just this continued focus on engaging with the community about, you know, what's working well and where are areas where we need to grow. Um, and so, you know, my goal in regards to kind of like the articles of agreement we talked about initial surveying and stuff is to possibly get them to try to get us a report by September based on what feedback they got. I just think that that could serve us well in regards to like if there's areas where we're not meeting expectations, we could use that report to inform budget. Um, so that's sort of why I thought that timeline made sense for us. Um, because I, I want us to be able to engage with our public saying we really want this information and we will use it to inform our work moving forward. Um, and so thus far we have uh, for membership um, we would have Jeff Clayton who is a our community-based learning educator at the high school but also is a resident of Chelsea um, his wife teaches for us as well and I believe he he's planning to send his his kids to us at the high school level so I think that it's good to have one outside community member but also a faculty member engaged on the committee. Emily Miller, who's a teacher here at the middle school, but also a Bethel resident, has had kids go through our, our school system. Mary Shell, uh, Chris Gray is part of our maintenance and facility staff here, but also has had kids go through our system. And, and some of you get to see his daughter um, as our celebration on learning last year at the SU level, board level in regards to the rifle making. Um, and we have Sandy Russo, who's from Royalton, uh, who was a, um, who's a Royalton community member, but also had worked as an interventionist at Royalton for a long time. Yep. Two subs now. Yep, and there's a sub. Yep. Uh, we have Leah Ferrante. Yep. I didn't butcher the name. No, you said it right. Yeah, it's good. I did? Yeah. Even though I'm tired, I'm doing all right. As a White River Valley High School student who's going to join the, the task force. Um, and then we also have Aaron Slater, who's a Royalton resident and an elementary school parent from Royalton. Um, so I would also look um, to at least have, I'd love two board members to possibly think about engaging. At least one um, would be great. And then principals, I'd like you guys all to be part of it, that you could be there um, as either guests or participate. I think that we should list the three of them um as members um and then we can kind of sort out how that's going to work in your guys' schedules um but that's where we're at right now again i think we could add more membership right but that i'm pretty happy i think we got a pretty good representation across the two towns and we certainly don't want it to be a 30 member yeah. task force so we won't get anything done probably but um i feel better about the representation now um, since we've been putting calls out. Okay. Um, I would be interested in being on this committee, I think. Um, is there. I would too. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else interested? I'll at least do an all. I, I'll, I'd be happy to come to the ones that I can. If they're during times mm -hmm. I can come, I will be happy to come. Okay. Well, I guess the question is, do you want to, or are you just uh, willing to? <laughs> yeah, I, would, I would recommend you do well, no more than... Well, a combination of both. <laughs> yeah. Don't do more than three. Yeah. Because um, then you're going to be warning board meetings. Oh. Right. And not 
task force meetings. So three would be the most in regards to at one time. Okay. Um, just because then you have a quorum of the board and yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. Well, we got our two, and if Peggy wants to be a yes and no kind of when she can, that's fine with me. Okay. <clears throat> that all right? That works. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would look for you guys to move those folks. Second, do a vote. And Tammy, I'll send you the list of names so you can include them in the notes. Does that work? Yep. Um, so we're going to I'd entertain a motion to appoint um, Jeff Clayton, Emily Miller, Mary Snell, Chris Gray, Sandy Russo, Leah Ferrante. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Aaron Slater, Andrew Jones, uh, Nancy Bajui, um, and um, Peggy, are you being appointed as an official member here or kind of an alternate? <laughs> oh uh, you're, you're muted. <laughs> I think that's enough. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 it all depends on what time it is. If it's a time I can come, then yes, I will be in the Your group time. will get to decide that, is sort of my okay. thought. Yeah, yeah. So moved. <clears throat> I'll wait in the principles if we could. Mm -hmm. Oh, and um, the principles. <laughs> yeah, and they'll decide. We'll figure it out. They won't all three come, but. We need to sort out who's going to go. Just... So moved. <laughs> okay, do we have a second? Yes. Okay, any discussion? And all in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Um, okay, uh, then just to quickly uh, show the mailer um, cover. Adjustment. I said that to Ray, so he's going to pull it up. <clears throat> um, so my thought was, why end up breaking it into kind of three different sections with, you know, informational meetings, an annual meeting, and school district directors election separated. The annual meeting section has discussion and vote for all bar articles, including budget. Um, it has the day of the week added in addition to the date so that people are clear that it's Monday and not Tuesday. Um, and then the things that apply to the annual meeting, I moved those up to there. So the community dinner, child care, and then must intend in person to vote on budget is all included in that section. And then we've got the school director's election by Australian ballot and the polls information under that. Um, so what do people think about this? Is that I like seem it. like what we discussed? Mm -hmm. Any further mm -hmm. comments? Uh, well, where it says must attend in person to vote on the budget should be polled, lighter and bold. Okay. Yeah. In my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you just quickly bold that? Um, are you able to edit this one? Uh, that just the must attend and push the vote on budget. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think that works. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, looks good. Thank you. It seems pretty clear. I, yeah. <laughs> I feel comfortable making a motion to approve this. So motion to approve. Okay. Yeah, I don't know that we need to do a motion or anything. No. We'll just make sure that we have this template. Oh, for all right. Well, this is everything we talked about. And yeah. I'm comfortable with this, and it doesn't leave many stones unturned. So should we? Look at you, Terry. Works for me. Good. Should we uh, make a point to discuss this in December? Um, yeah, I guess prior to the prior to putting it out next year, thanks for that. Let's just go over it again in case we want to sure. adjust something, or sure, yeah. that, or do we need to? Well, I think I, well, I guess we discuss it anyways, right? But, yeah, well, we don't really discuss the exact formation of that booklet. I, I do think having a little discussion about what should go in there or kind of. 
you know, I think it would be good to have right after this first page a single page summary of tax implications, you know, kind of like the bullet points of what people need to know so that, you know, people can go line by line on the budget that they want, but there's also just the one page like this is what you absolutely have to know um, kind of on that first page and then we have the warning. <coughs> um, so, you know, I think discussion about that and how best to present things might be worthwhile in December or mm -hmm. whenever we have an approved budget, I guess, is when we discuss it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's action, possible action, uh, the capital reserve funds for This is just to finish up the EI payment. Okay. Do we need to approve? Yep. Tara has it. Sorry. And this is this this came this last paid amount is under what they originally projected us by a little bit. I have all those figures. No, that's good. I was just summarizing. Yeah. <laughs> so we have our final we got our final bill from EEI. So the remaining balance due from the capital reserve fund is eighty four thousand one hundred sixty five dollars and fifty cents. So that's what I need you to approve to be withdrawn from the capital reserve funds. And to summarize, the total use of capital reserve funds was $265,428, which was $3,888 less than what was proposed to be utilized. Okay. Motion to approve $84,165.50 to pay the remainder of the bill to EEI from the capital reserve funds. Second. Okay, any discussion? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? All right, motion passes. Okay, uh, public comment. Um, is there any public comment at this time? I know there's some in the chat. Um, go ahead, Peggy, and then we'll look at what's in the chat. Okay, um, one of the things that um, I should mention or will be happening as quickly as possible, AOT is going to be doing some work south of the farm and there may be a couple of days where Route 14 is going to be closed at that spot. So I just wanted to say that when that happens, R1 will not be able to go down and turn around at the Sharon Fire Station, but they can turn around here in my driveway. Okay. So that the bus thing won't be affected. Thanks, Peggy. Do you have a sense when that might happen? Usually they reach out to us. I'm surprised. Uh, well, we, we only met with them today. <coughs> okay. Josh, we met with them because it happened on the border of our two properties. Got it. So um, they're hoping to at least get the trees down, but they've got to get consolidated to take the uh, telephone lines, put those down low, and get them covered and then come in and work on the trees, but they want to do it as soon as they can. All right, thank you very much. I'll, I'll get a hold of the bus company tomorrow. I can call them. Yeah, okay. On a similar note, I don't know when they're going back at the train bridge on my end of 14, but if it warms up a little bit more, they may be going, that might affect the, the single lane underpass. Yeah, you're talking about on the north side? On the north side, yeah. yeah. They were really good about communicating with that oh, last year. I don't know uh, when that's about to start again. They but haven't given me a date yet, but I'll reach out to them. I would they say good about it. That was a lot of emailing, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you no, know, I was going to say, a, a 60 days out, 90 days out, wouldn't surprise me one bit if they were. But this one, I that the one Peggy says I had no, no heads up about. All right. Um, from the public comment, uh, from the comments on the online thing, Kate Jarvis says um, for public comment, Mr. Laflam, um, I regret to regret that I have not had much opportunity to interact with you this year or to get to know you better. I do have questions and concerns as to what has been done this year to address behavior in the middle school this year compared to last year. And in past concerns brought to light, could you please speak to that? Or could you speak to that, please? Um, and then it continues, have there been new measures or programs brought in encouraging positive behavior? I found it very hard for the, um, I found it very hard for the majority of children to learn in the middle school with the level of disruption in the classroom. Thank you for speaking to this. 
I think the third thing is a different subject, so why don't you respond to that and then. Okay, thank you for the question, Ms. Jarvis. Uh, responding to the third question, when I made the comment about uh, fresher data, I'm talking about something that isn't a year or more old. Um, we have multiple windows for things like Track My Progress, so we um, can deal with that data within days, weeks, as opposed to within a year. My hope, I believe I was saying in the context of my hope for the VT cap moving forward is that they have a much faster turnaround. So we're looking at um, the data around the same time that the cohort under study is still in that grade or has just transitioned. Um, talking about behaviors in general, that that could be a huge discussion. So I encourage if, if I just give you a, a survey of some of the things we've done, please feel free to engage me at length. Um, more than willing to talk at any other time. I can't speak to what my predecessor did, what specific programs um, were in place that aren't in place now. I can speak to how we've addressed some behaviors. Uh, one of the things we did early on with our data teams was look at behavioral data, frequency, uh, a specific behavior, which one was the most prevalent, where was it happening the most, when. Um, and there have been points throughout the school year where we have addressed the highest flying behaviors, let's say the top three. Uh, we did that following the Thanksgiving November break. We did that in part just a few weeks ago. And we set out uh, expectations for all students, with all students. For example, um, my colleague Kate Mayer, the student support coordinator, and I took these identified behaviors, spoke to every single student by class, by grade, and are doing our best to hold a consistent practice. I'll give you an example of something that might have been considered low level or might seem low level, walking by and flipping someone's hat off. We lumped into the category of a physical aggression because we've seen what that turns into. As an example, that's something where um, once we're past the warning, uh, we apply a pretty strict consequence on par with um, walking by and and kicking someone. Uh, so looking at very specific behaviors, again, the most frequent, we're taking the bites we can. Um, we're also looking at how parts of a PBIS type school can align with what students learn for expectations in elementary school, the kinds of expectations they'll have when they move on to high school, trying to align our systems. I have a team going next week, along with some of their colleagues from around the district, to continue that kind of work. Um, so those are a couple of points in terms of how we sought to address behavior. In general, uh, Kate Mayer and myself look at what does the word restorative actually mean? It incorporates accountability, it incorporates owning what you did and figuring out how you make it right. Any student coming into the office has to process in a very similar way around those points. Uh, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend it's perfect every single time, but we are doing our best to continue to evolve the system into something that responds to behaviors consistently. Uh, I'll give you one last example. Um, right now we're noticing slash minorly struggling with students that aren't in class on time. The, we've recently instituted a chime slash bell system and we're noticing students still gathering out in the hallway so as a staff today in our faculty meeting we talked about how faculty can be consistent how the admin can be consistent so the communication is is thorough predictable we're using things that seem simple like passes um, having a protocol in place where we don't get into power struggles if a student's late to your class they're turned away and sent to retrieve the pass the reason I mentioned that example is we're trying to move from a reactive to a looking at what we're dealing with and how can we predict a better outcome, how can we institute some consistency, how can we improve communication, um, and continue to keep our eye on that evolution. So there's, there's a lot in your question. I hope that gave you enough of a, a, a moose bouche or appetizer. Again, feel free to, to reach out, set a time where we can sit down and talk at length in general about the system. And if you have a, a, a specific question now, I'd certainly entertain it. 
Um, just to respond to the third comment about um, the uh, fresher testing data, the Track My Progress reports, we got a report from that on the February um, <coughs> board meeting. So that is available in the reports and documents um, folder of the February board meeting minutes if you look on the website. So, okay. Uh, is there any other public comment at this time? All right, then um, new hires and resignations. Nope, oh, Tammy, go ahead. Sorry, I couldn't get to the draw there. Um, I look forward to you, Andrew, double checking what's available out there um, in the minutes with that um, track my data information so that it is available out there. Um, I don't think it's out there right now. No, it is. It's not in the minutes, okay. it's in the reports and documents board that kind of what um, the reports that we get prior to the um, meeting wind up in a folder that the minutes go into that same folder. So, um, okay, so I know it's there because I, I found it earlier and it's actually was you know posted on Facebook okay. and stuff. So. I'll look again. Um, <clears throat> I had a comment. Um, do we need to address any of those items that I identified potentially? Is there no longer a finance committee? Is there no longer a facilities committee? Is there no longer a recruitment and communications facility? Um, and do we need an RTCC representative? Oh, that's a good point. Um, we, we can address them next month. Yes, we will. We will make sure those are on the agenda for next month. We do. And need to who do, do I send things. the minutes to if I'm supposed to send them somewhere? Um, I wasn't at the March 14th meeting. I apologize, and I don't yep. have any updates, and the minutes aren't out there yet. <laughs> yep. Um, <coughs> Julie Hemmons, the new clerk. So you're going to be um, emailing the minutes to her and to me. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tammy. As always, we very much appreciate <coughs> you being our recording secretary. Um, okay, so there was no new hires resignations. We have a new, new hire, hire in our, yeah. our high school counselor, okay. Alec uh, Warzenak, has uh, just accepted the position as high school counselor. He was at uh, Black River, um, few, which is a 7 through 12 school, was a 7 through 12 school for many years, which is kind of more like our school, you know, it's like the high school. Uh, counselors now seem to do a lot of different things, and he seems to fit this, the bar because of his, he likes to do scheduling, he, he still counsels, but he also does a lot with um, like classwork with students and stuff and organizing them so they have a pathway towards graduation. So, um, And next is our um, admin uh, administrative assistant to the counselor, but we wanted to have a counselor first to be part of that process, so sure. they get a big vote. All right. Tammy, I'm going to send you that spelling just so you have it. You do not know how much I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm doing right. yeah, yeah. I, I, did, I, I butchered it. I'm sure it's not said like that. He goes by Alex W. So, so can. <laughs> so, yeah. um, Thank you. I don't think we have any other at this point. Uh, future agenda items. We need to add the task forces. Task forces and um, our TCC. Um, board member. Um, next me. Oh, uh, I also wanted to have um, kind of an update on the eco program for next month. Um, and so next meeting date is Wednesday, April sixteenth. Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. What's that about? Oh, that's, that's weird. Um, <laughs> Is April 16th, Wednesday, or vice versa? It's a Tuesday. Okay. okay, so that should say Tuesday, April 16th, um, which is the third Tuesday, so. The date's right, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's Tuesday, April 16th, 2024, at 7 p.m. Uh, that'll be your next meeting. I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded. All right, thanks, everybody. Who did you appoint for AP? Thanks, Joshua. Rodney, Rodney, and then I'm the alt. That's the alt. Are you currently the alt? All right, we know the process then.